There's a peace missing in each of us that only God can fill. He has appointed one person, his only son, to fill that missing piece, that empty longing, that unfulfilled something. And anyone or anything that tries to get access to that place in your soul that only Jesus Christ can fill is a thief and a robber. Take your Bibles, please, and open to uh, the book of uh, John. I'm kind of fired up to get back to John. Seems like a while since we've been there. Uh, overdue in my mind. And uh, so uh, back to our study, Authentic Jesus, in John chapter 10. And uh, so excited to open God's Word uh, with you. While you're turning to John chapter 10, um, I've told you in the past that when Kathy and I, we don't really hardly fight at all anymore. I'm really happy to report that. 30 years married this summer, there's no fights at all. I just give in on everything. And, <laughs> and uh, but back when, back when we were first married, I had, to, uh, I had to have some, we had to have some rules for fair fighting. We fought, anybody fight a lot when they're first married? Come on, don't leave me up here. And uh, so we had some rules, you know, you can't bring up the past and you can't say anything personal. We just had rules. If you broke the rules, you lose the fight. So uh, one of the rules that we had for fair fighting was uh, don't uh, show me, tell me. Because, you know, one person would get upset and then all of a sudden the other person, you know, you're standing there like this and like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And the answer, when you say, what's wrong, what's the answer? Nothing. Nothing. But actually nothing means everything, something. <laughs> And, and so, you know, don't show me, don't, don't show me, tell me. And if that's true uh, with a, you know, little silly quarrel uh, in a marriage relationship, uh, the more uh, powerful the truth, the more penetrating the truth, the more the need at times to move beyond showing to telling. And the message of the Gospel of John has been a lot of showing. And Jesus has turned water to wine, and he met with the woman at the well, and, and he has been uh, healing and feeding, and uh, about in the next chapter, he's going to raise somebody from the dead. But here in John chapter 10, he stops with the showing that he's who he is, that he's very God, that he is the Word that became flesh. He stops proving it. He stops showing it. And there comes a time when you just have to be crystal clear. So uh, we already know that the Gospel of John has seven I am statements. I hope you're underlining them in your Bible. I've been getting great uh, comfort to my own heart from these uh, statements. We've already had I am uh, the bread of life. We've already had I am the light of the world. There's two of the first seven. But here in John chapter 10, in fact, in the message today, we're going to get two more. And I want to encourage you as you get these, Jesus says, I am, but we can say, if you're his, through faith in him, you can say, I have, I have the bread of life. I have the light of the world. And uh, two more of those are coming our way right now. The title of the message again, uh, don't show me, uh, tell me. All right. He's about to do that right now. Jot this down, Jesus the door. Jesus the door, I follow his voice to salvation. Let me just read uh, the passage uh, to you as a way of uh, getting into it, and then we'll go back over it. Uh, let's just get the first six verses. Jesus begins, John 10, 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief, a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him. For they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. This What's it say? This figure of speech 
Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Now, um, it's complicated. Turn to, your, turn to your neighbor and say, it's complicated. If you weren't committed to teaching through the Bible verse by verse, and we are, right? If you weren't committed to that, this would be one you'd skip over. Uh, but we're not going to skip over it, and there's awesome things in it, but I have to say it's complicated. Here's two things that will help as we're going to begin to go into these uh, first uh, 21 verses. Um, first of all, the context. Though it's many weeks ago now, uh, we finished up in the last verse of John chapter 9, and notice that there's no a designation of time. For example, in verse 22, after verse 21, where we'll end up today, he says, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter. So we know that what happens in verse 22 was sometime after verse 21. However, there's no designation, and these chapter divisions are not part of the original inspiration of Scripture. And so because there's no uh, time designation, it's quite likely that what he says in chapter 10, verse 1, happened a few seconds after what happened at the end of chapter 9. So remember, blind guy gets his sight, religious leaders ticked off, fronting the blind guy, who can now see, and saying, what the heck, how this happened to you? Who did this? And how that, who knew that? How'd that happen to you? And, and he's like, I don't know, do you want to become one of his followers too? And then they're just like, they want to pull their hair out. Because they, really, they don't care about the blind guy, they hate Jesus. And so he's confronting the self-righteous religious leaders. That's the context. Now here's the second thing. You gotta notice the context to get John 10. Secondly, you gotta know that it is an allegory. Chapter 10, verse six calls it a figure of speech. Now, you might remember from uh, your English class that an allegory is a metaphoric teaching which compares a physical familiarity to a spiritual reality. Pilgrim's Progress is a lengthy allegory. Uh, not like a, a, a parable is more of an actual story, but uh, so there's some overlap here. But, but an allegory is where something very familiar to us, for example, here the allegory is about shepherds and sheep. Now, how many people here uh, own sheep? Okay, so it's not as familiar to us then as it was to the people in the New Testament times, but in the New Testament times, there's sheep everywhere and on the hillsides. And if you weren't a shepherd, your brother was, or you knew somebody who was, and, and everybody kind of understood sheep imagery. We're going to try to supply some of that content as we go through here. But Jesus, in talking to these people, was using something very familiar to them in the physical realm, and he was drawing analogy through allegory to, from physical realities that were familiar to spiritual realities that are significant. All right, so that's why there's an allegory here. Now, what makes it complicated is, is he kind of mixes the metaphor a bit. At the start of the passage, um, he's the one who goes through the right door, and before we get to verse 9, he is the door. So you got to just kind of trace along with how he's using that. If you're ready to jump in now in detail to verse 1, say jump. jump. All right, here it comes. Truly, truly, which we know that Jesus says that multiple times in the Gospel of John as a way of saying, um, uh, really important, make a note of this. I would say, if you like to write things down, write this down. That's what I always say. That's the same as truly, truly. I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold, the sheep is where the sheep are. The sheep are the people. That's you and me. We're the sheep. If you're one of the sheep, make a sheep noise. Go ahead. Wait, 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 wait. All right. Hey, any, any sheep here? All right, all right, so uh, the sheep are the people. And he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way. That man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. All right, this will help. God the Father is the gatekeeper. We're the sheep. God created every one of us in such a way that we have in our souls an emptiness, a, a loneliness, a lack that only God can fill. 
Augustine said that our hearts are restless until they find rest in God. We were up at the uh, church camp with our family uh, over the holiday weekend, and I was with my uh, grandson, Carter. Uh, He's four years old now, and we were making puzzles. There's Landon and I with Carter, and we were, that kid can make puzzles better than me. You like to think that as you get older, you get some skills down, right? I'm sitting there like I was really trying. And he would like reach and take a piece out of my hand and put it over here. I did an old school move and I took one of the puzzle pieces and held it in my hand till the end. (laughs) We're working away. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. Actually, when we got to the end, I softened and I gave him the piece. And I said, here, you can put the last piece in. But then I noticed I didn't have all the pieces in. And here's a close up of the puzzle it's man Kathy bought that thing at a garage sale now I know why she got it for a dollar (laughs) the piece was missing look at look at that's you all right that's you and me there's a piece missing in each of us that only God can fill now he has appointed one person his only son to fill that missing piece, that empty longing, that unfulfilled something. And we can all think of a lot of things that we have tried to put into that empty space that doesn't fill us. And people and preachers and so-called prophets and Pharisees who try to fill that void, that missing piece with what? with self-help, with self-fulfillment, with self-actualization, or worst of all, with themselves. They're the people that are trying to sneak into the sheep another way. And anyone or anything that tries to get access to that place in your soul that only Jesus Christ can fill is a thief and a robber. That's what it's saying. Stealing fulfillment, robbing you of true salvation, leaving you shattered and searching. Listen, Buddha is a thief that's trying to come in another way. Muhammad is a thief who's trying to come in another way. Gandhi is a thief who's trying to come in another way. Joseph Smith is a Mormon thief. Charles Russell is the founder of what became known as Jehovah's Witness. They're thieves, all right? and Presbyterians and Catholics and Baptists and Lutherans, all of them are robbers if they're not prescribing the one thing that can satisfy the cavity in the human soul which God created only Jesus Christ to fill. The gatekeeper opens to him. Amen. Amen. The gatekeeper opens to him. He's the only one who has God the Father Almighty has given access to your soul. Only him. Now, with that in your mind, look at back at these wonderful verses. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way. That man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd, say Jesus, He who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. And I love this part. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Um, Shepherds would understand this in New Testament times. We've seen this on our trips to Israel. We went to Bethlehem and they can actually take you to the hillsides where the first shepherds heard the announcement of Jesus' birth. And, and uh, the shepherds would cover the hillsides with their own flock of sheep, 15 or 20 or 25 or 30. But at night, they would bring them back in. They wouldn't leave them out. The shepherds have to sleep and they would take their sheep and they would put them in a, in a pen, in a fold with many other sheep. You know, that's gonna get confusing in the morning. Actually not, because the sheep, the shepherds would come back in the morning and they would call out, come on. And all the sheep that were with that shepherd would recognize his, say it, they would recognize his voice. These things aren't as familiar to us, but the people who heard Jesus speak these words, they knew exactly what he meant when he said, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. 
when he has brought out all his own, underline that word own in your Bible, please, loved ones. It's going to be real important later in this message. When he has brought out his own, he goes before them. Think of the comfort in that. Your, your uh, shepherd, Jesus, goes before you. He goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Yes, we do. Help us, Lord. And the sheep follow him, for they know his, say it, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So many calling for us. Material things calling. We hear that voice. Sensual things calling. Temporal things. Substances calling out to us. I will make you happy. I will fill that void. I will give you peace experiences. Try this, try this, try this. Accomplishments. You'll be something. You'll make a name for yourself. Get this accomplished and that emptiness will go away. Calling your name, demanding your loyalty, stealing your heart. So again, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, here it is, I am the door of the sheep. What an awesome assertion. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them, did not, do not, will not. His own will not hear another voice. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find green pasture. The I am statements, as I've said already, I am the light of the world, I am the bread of life. There's number three, I am the door. Now he's not the one going in the door as in the beginning of John 10. Now he's actually, he himself is the door. The I am statement is very significant. I am echoing God's revelation to Moses. I am, he said. Moses said, well, I, I gotta tell people what your name is. He says, tell them I am sent you. I am that I am. This is the unspeakable name. Call me Yahweh. Jesus is strongly insisting, and this is what's enraging the Pharisees, that he is eternal God. By taking those words on his lips, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. It's hard for us without the deep familiarity with the Old Testament to realize this, this outrageous, awesome, eternally life-changing truth that Jesus is the God of eternity, second person of the Trinity, Awesome, awesome truth. And here I am uh, the door. Now, uh, I love the end of verse 9. Uh, notice it. Uh, sheep don't need a lot. Again, uh, just to be familiar a little bit with the uh, sheep analogy. Sheep don't need a lot. They really don't. They don't need uh, shelter. They live outside. They don't need clothes. They make clothes. <laughs> They don't really need much at all. The one thing they need is, tell me, they don't need shelter, they don't need clothing, they just need, the they just need food, they just need food. But they're kind of, um, you know, sheep are known for being, don't be insulted, I'm one too, we're all sheep, make the noise again. Yeah. Kind of known for being a little clueless, honestly. A sheep, um, you know, not the sharpest knives in the drawer is what I'm saying. And, and so, um, we, we're, 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 we're hungry. Come on, come on, Ooh, bleh, bleh. And, and they just need to be led. The only thing they need is grass, green pasture. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me, sometimes he has to make me, lie down in, say it, in green pastures. Now, look at the end of verse 9. I am the door. If any enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. In Jesus Christ, the sheep find all they need. All they need. In him we find all we need. And that's the point, of course, of verse 10 summarizes that lesson. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's 
Uh, the thief Satan, who's behind all thieves of false religion, the big thief, the ultimate thief, the author of all thievery and false accesses to the sheep that is not through Jesus. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, tell us Jesus, why did you come? I came that they, the sheep, may have life and have it abundantly. So the gift of life, the gift of eternal life, and the gift of abundant life, fulfilling, meaningful, satisfying, restful, peace-filled life. That's why Jesus came. And, and he says, you, do you want that? He says, I'm the door. Only gonna get this right here. I'm the door. You're gonna have to come through. Do you want wisdom? Jesus Christ is wisdom. Do you want peace? He is our peace, the scripture says. Do you want strength? Jesus Christ is our strength. Do you want hope? My hope is in the Lord. All that our hearts have been looking for and longing for is accessed through the door who is Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. And we say, I have a door. I have a door. I've heard his voice. Notice it in the text. Verse three, his voice. Verse four, his voice. They know the voice. Verse five. Really enjoying not just circulating in the lobbies of the church, but also uh, the opportunity to pray with people. And I was, uh, yesterday in the service, I was um, in the back hallway here. And, and uh, what a privilege I had to have a man who brought someone to church with him. And he said, I'd like you to meet my friend. And she said, I'm so happy to be here. And I could tell she was moved by her awareness of that empty place in her soul. And I just said, have you ever given your life to Christ? She said, well, no, I haven't. I said, do you want to? He loves you. He'll forgive you for everything. She said, oh, I need to be forgiven. I said, we all do. Everyone needs a savior. Jesus is the only savior. He's the only door. He's the only way. I said, would you like to pray and give your life to Christ right now? She said, I would. And you're not 20 feet from here, just out behind here. I had such an awesome privilege just to pray with her. And she turned from her sin and gave her life to Jesus Christ. Now, awesome. Amen. Awesome. Listen, listen. Have you done that? Have you done that? Have you allowed, have you entered by the door? Look at, look at. Only one person has been given true access by the Father to the sheep. He's the way in. He's the door himself. All that your heart has been looking for and longing for is found in Jesus Christ. He will change everything, the way you think, what matters to you, what, what you think about for the future. He will take you and he will change you and make your life into things that you never dreamed it could be. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? Do it today. Do it today to turn the preacher out, bow your head right now and turn from your sin and embrace Jesus Christ by faith. He will become the, the object of your highest affections. He will become the, the, the object of your deepest adoration. He will become everything to you. You give it all up to find him and you feel like it was nothing to leave it behind to find the treasure that is Jesus Christ. Am I speaking truth in the church today? Amen, amen. Jesus the door, Jesus the door. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the scripture says, and you will be saved. I follow his voice to salvation. And then this, Jesus the good shepherd. Jesus the good shepherd. I embrace his ownership for security. Notice, uh, notice now, um, starting in verse 11. There it is. I am the good shepherd. Man, he's on a roll right now. I'm telling you, these I am statements are huge, and we've got seven only in the whole Gospels, and we've got two in two verses. I am the door, verse nine. There it is. I am the good shepherd. Awesome. I've been putting these pictures up. I think if you've been around here for a while, you know I love the painter Warner Salmon. He lived 70 years, died in 1968, but his portraits of Jesus uh, standing at the door, 
Jesus who is the door, and then uh, his portrait here of Jesus. This is very well known, his portrait of Jesus with the sheep. Notice how little they are. They, it's just beautiful the way he portrayed Christ our shepherd. They don't even come up to his knees. They're like little, little toy sheep. I have no problem with Jesus Christ towering over little insignificant me. Do you have a problem with that? I just love the view of Christ. And notice, notice him, like Isaiah said, he will lead his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the, the young in his arms. He will tenderly lead those that are with young. And uh, I love that. that, that I got, I'm going to get there one of these days. Anderson, Indiana, the whole Warner, Salmon. Has anybody ever been to that to see that? Have you really? I got to go there. Flat out, I, I'm, I'm a little envious of you this morning. I really want to go and see that collection of, the, of these portraits that he painted of the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the good shepherd, I embrace his ownership for security. Now, it, um, I can only go where the text goes. It's good to be led by the word of God, and, and he actually uh, now is going to roll out a warning. Okay, so warning, there's a warning coming. So I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be warned at church. I just, I just want to be encouraged. Well, that's going to be a problem because we're committed to the scriptures at harvest. And uh, John warned and Peter warned and Paul warned, it seemed almost continuously. And they were following the shepherd Jesus and he warns. Now here comes a warning. Well, let me just read it. Um, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep but he also cares enough to warn the sheep that not all shepherds are good shepherds. Here it comes. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep. Let's talk hired hand for a minute. I, I'll try to use a, a, an example from something I know. Um, I'm really good at eating. And that's like one of my best things. Anybody else here good at eating? It's like, it's one of my best things. I'm really good at that. And I'd just like to share some of my wisdom with you for a moment. For example, I don't know if you uh, have figured this out yet, but a good Mexican food is like one of the best things. In fact, I told this story in church last night about good Mexican food and like everyone's coming to me, I said, we gotta go out for Mexican food right now. And, and so, you know, st stay with me on this. But um, here's one of the keys to finding, skip all the chains, Skip all the fake Mexican food. Don't go to the place that has all the cuisine. Here's what you're looking for. You're looking for the Mexican restaurant where the owner is still cooking in the kitchen. Find the dive because all his friends were like, man, that was good. You, you flat out gotta start a restaurant. He's like, all right. That's how it happened. So he's in the kitchen doing now as his business what his family and friends said he was amazing at. Okay. Now, once it gets big and he starts getting a bunch of high school students in there cooking, no offense, that's not going to be as good. There's some skill involved here. And so um, after church last night, they made me take them to a place like that. So I went to the place down, I won't say where, but um, man, that was a big mistake because I guess it got good or something because he's not in the kitchen anymore. Once you get a hired hand in the kitchen, it's not as good because they don't care as much. They just don't care. They're not passionate about the quality. Turn to your neighbor and say, why is he telling us this? Here's why, look at the text. Here's why. He who is a hired hand. Apparently the shepherd had so many sheep he couldn't take care of them all by himself so he had to hire it out. And part of the problem with hiring it out is, is the hired guy just doesn't love the sheep the way the owner does. Just doesn't. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's a hired hand, not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep. <laughs> he sees the wolf. That's like, dun, 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 dun. Because the wolf's coming now. This is like the worst thing that can happen in sheep world is for a wolf to show up. Ready? He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming. You should be scared. I hope you're scared. What does he do? He, like that's, that's awful. He leaves the sheep and flees. I'm out of here, man. I, I didn't sign up for this. 
No, I mean, I'm just getting paid to watch, man. I'm not getting paid to fight. I'm not getting paid to defend. I'm not getting paid to shed blood. I'm out of here. It's costing me something. Now, remember the analogy is we're the sheep. Well, let me just give you this. I have a three characteristics of hirelings, hired hands. I'm, I'm sorry to have to say this, but it's a warning, so here it comes. A hired hand is a youth worker or a children's ministry worker or a small group leader or an elder or, or a pastor. They're not here for the sheep. They're here for themselves. It's just a paycheck. It's just a significance. It's just a, I like this. And as soon as it gets hard, as soon as it gets difficult, as soon as it costs something, they're like, I am out of here. I'm flat out out of here. I don't need this. I didn't sign up for this. And, and that, hurts, that hurts the sheep. And the shepherds, and we're called, I'm called, some of you are called to be under shepherds, to help shepherd this flock. The, the good under shepherds are like the chief shepherd. The first Peter five calls Jesus the chief shepherd. And the good under shepherds, they, they lay down their life for the sheep. We do anything to help, to encourage, to strengthen, to even when it costs, even when it hurts, but not the hirelings. Notice these three facts about hired hands. Number one, they won't stand for the sheep. They won't take a stand when the wolf comes. And because they won't stand for the sheep, they won't stay for the sheep. I mean, just, I'm out of here. Too hard. Didn't sign up for this. And then worst, what's really driving all of it is, is they won't suffer for the sheep. Now you want to place yourself under the care of those following the good shepherd that are willing to suffer for the sheep. Even when it's hard, even when it costs, even when it's difficult, God help us to be shepherds and not hirelings. Jesus warned about this, Matthew 7, 15. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you outwardly as sheep, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Ravenous wolves, hired hand, not a shepherd, doesn't own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. Worse than being a hireling is being a wolf. The chief wolf is Satan. He's behind all the other wolves. And uh, he flees because he's a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. But I've got to just stop there and, and give a little further warning. I went, to, I went, I went uh, bear hunting a couple of weeks ago. And I'd been planning it for a long time. I went with Bill Martin, one of the founders of our church. He'd been a faithful man in our church for 25 years. And we went bear hunting. He met some walk in the word listener somewhere who lives in northern Idaho, who's kind of like a hunting guide. And so he took us out. I went a couple of weeks ago. I, I probably wouldn't have gone if they had told me what, we're, what I was up against. And uh, some of you give me like that. Look, you went hunting for bear. I did. And if it helps uh, you at all, I didn't kill one. So if some of you are like, I can't believe you went hunting. I didn't kill one. If some of you are like, awesome, he went hunting. Um, I tried to kill one. <laughs> all right. So I believe I've, I've accommodated all concerns here. Just try to kind of go down the middle on that. And, and uh, so anyway, I didn't really understand what I was getting into. I had to go sit. I had to go in a car for like 45 minutes into the northern Idaho wilderness. Then I had to get on an ATV and like ride for another half an hour. And I was out there, let me tell you. And, and I got into this little kind of uh, crest of a hill in a forest and I had to climb up this ladder into this tree stand about 18 feet off the ground and sit there and look. <laughs> For an hour I sat there. And another hour. Over four days I sat there like this for over 20 hours. <laughs> That's a long time. I hope y'all are, I prayed for y'all like three or four different times over, so I hope y'all are doing really good right now. <laughs> I, and I had to sit there for a long time. And, and, and after you've been sitting there for a while, you start hearing things. Let me tell you, oh, whoa, whoa, something's coming. And then it gets kind of blurry. I think that might be a bear. <laughs> it, you start to see stuff. 
And, and uh, I think that that probably is what, was, uh, what goes on with being a shepherd. I mean, what do shepherds do? And what are they looking for? Looking for wolves. And how many hours do they sit there? And, and do they begin to think they see a wolf? Uh, maybe when they don't even uh, see one? We found some of these pictures. Can you, uh, first of all, in regard to wolves and, and, and uh, sheep, uh, let me get this out of the way. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not a joke, okay? When Jesus talked about wolves in sheep's clothing, it wasn't a joke, okay? This is life and death. Okay, wolves are ruthless. What's interesting, being up in this place in Idaho, uh, the Department of Natural Resources, um, they've reintroduced the wolf. They thought, well, we should have wolves here. Why don't we have wolves anymore? Because they killed them all. Okay, we're like, well, we're gonna bring more wolves. You should now it's, it's out of control. They reintroduced the wolf. Now it's so overrun, almost the entire elk population is decimated. What a foolish thing. You shoot wolves, that's what you do. You don't rate, they hunt in packs, okay? And, and they are ruthless. They find one weak animal and they run it out of the pack and then they pile on it and they devour it. The Bible has nothing good to say about wolves and it's the picture that Jesus chose to describe people who try to, um, I mean, I could say so much about this. Um, generally speaking, uh, wolves have significant doctrinal error major unbiblical doctrine okay they deny the word of god the deity of christ the authority of the bible the trinity the salvation by grace alone through faith alone in christ alone they have unbiblical doctrine they have ungodly behavior they have unconfessed failure in their life almost inevitably they, they don't respond to accountability wolves don't listen to anybody their, their attack is unrelenting now Wolves are dangerous on the outside, but now hear this. The most destructive thing that happens in, a, in the life of a church is when a shepherd becomes a wolf. That happens probably about four times in the 25 year history of our church. We've had shepherds become wolves and nothing throws the sheep into confusion like when a shepherd becomes a wolf. And I have no joy in saying this, but uh, you say, well, how does that happen? Jot these five things down, how to become a wolf, not because you'd ever want to, but so that you can see it happening and be on guard. We're on guard with you. How to become a wolf, here they come. Number one, offense over forbearance. There is so much forbearance involved in being a shepherd. And you, how'd you cut yourself again? How'd you get lost? Where'd you go? Uh, shepherds have to forbear in love and keep loving and keep loving and keep loving. And, and when a shepherd decides, that's an offense, that's an offense, and I'm going to carry that. I'm gonna carry that. What you said, what you did, how you, you weren't thankful, I tried, I'm not appreciated, I'm not getting my due. Once a shepherd gets focused on himself, he becomes like a hireling. Notice it says, verse 12, he was a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So, offense over forbearance. Where does that go? It goes to bitterness over forgiveness. We are, hear this, our master, Jesus Christ, commands us to displace offense with forgiveness. It is not possible to be married to one person for a lifetime without offense. Forgiveness is the way out of that. It is not possible to pastor one church or to do one faithful anything without forgiveness. You'll get good at forgiveness or you'll get good at bitterness. You'll get better or you'll get bitter, period. And when you get bitter, it's because you've chosen not to forgive. Hebrews 12 warns us, 
that a root of bitterness will spring up and cause trouble, listen, and will defile many people. Hebrew says, beware of bitterness. It defiles many people. I didn't get what I want. I didn't get what I expected. I didn't get what I need. Hireling, hireling. Shepherds aren't thinking about what they're getting. They're thinking about the sheep. And when shepherds go south, offense over forbearance, bitterness over forgiveness. You say, well, how can I tell if that's happening? You won't have to wait long. They'll tell you slander over silence. Wolves have a lot to say. How can you tell if he's bitter? Just listen. False words of vengeance to collect on a debt I won't forgive. Slander. When the Word of God says, look up here, I'm excited to quote this scripture to you. Ephesians 4 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's what sheep do, and that's what shepherds are called to model, and it's so destructive when they don't. Slander over silence, and then this is the worst, I think, a scatter over unity. They wouldn't suppress their thought for the sake of unity. They wouldn't channel their disagreement for the sake of unity. Now look, a wolf is not a good person with a disagreement. It's not that. Everyone say it's not that. It's not that. A wolf is not a person who complains. I'm not even talking about that. I wish people wouldn't complain, but, but they do. And you, you, you live with that. You manage that. A, a wolf is not a person who changes churches for goodness sake. And, and you can make the decision to go to a different church, a closer church, a smaller church, a better church. And, and God bless you and keep growing in Christ. Shepherds wouldn't resent or be angry about that. No, no, a wolf is a person who turns and begins to attack the work of Christ that they used to give themselves uh, to building. They put scattering over unity and lastly, they put themselves over the sheep. Like the hirelings, verse 13, they care nothing for the sheep. Now, here's the good news. Let's keep our hearts close to Jesus, loved ones. Amen? Because he's the good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. Well, how can you tell if you have a good shepherd? Watch for this. I lay down my life for the sheep. I'm giving my life for the sheep, Jesus says. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. If I'm the good shepherd, I know my own. Remember I told you to underline that in verse 4? Here it is again. I know my own. My own know me. Jesus is telling you today that if you're one of his children through faith in him, he owns you. He flat out owns you. You're like, well, that helps actually because he acts like he owns me. He does. <laughs> Why does he act like he owns me all the time? Because he does. Okay. And Paul said, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. You belong to Jesus. You are his property. And so much more will make sense if you will just submit to his ownership in your life. We know how to own things, but do we know how to be owned? Do we know how to belong to Jesus Christ? I wrote this. It's my own testimony. I hope that you relate to it. I belong to Jesus Christ. I am his personal property. His wishes are my wishes. His will is my own. His way is my way, all the way till the end. When he commands forgiveness, which is always, I grant it without question, he's the boss. He owns me. He expects generosity, so I seek to be generous. He demands faithfulness, and I'm really trying, and he helps me. He pursues my holiness by allowing me to suffer, and I submit to his discipline because he's in charge. He owns me. Every dream I've had is in his hands. Every burden I carry, I've prayed onto his heart. He's my owner, and I trust him. My greatest joy is to belong to Jesus Christ. 
My greatest goal is to bring glory to Jesus Christ. My greatest privilege is to be numbered as one of his slaves. He's my owner, and he is good, good, good to me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, that's our security, loved ones. I have a, he's the door, and he's the shepherd. Jesus, the good shepherd, I embrace his ownership for security. I know my own, he says, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now he says this finally. Jesus the door, Jesus the good shepherd. Notice Jesus the life giver. He's been saying it over and over. I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. Here it comes again, verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. He's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about us, actually. This is how we got into this. It was originally just for the Jewish people. Now it's for everyone. Amen? Amen. So he says, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Awesome. How great's going to be the day when there's no denominations and no separations and no sects just one shepherd and all of us under his leadership. Everyone say awesome. I mean, just, yeah, come Lord Jesus. And the, the unity, that, wait till we get to John 17 and you hear him praying for that, you know? And, and Jesus wants Christians to get along, not to fight. He wants us to get along. What, what, do you, what do you want for your adult kids? I got three adult kids. What do you want for your kids if they're grown? I want them to love Jesus and get along. After that, everything else is bonus. I just want them to love Jesus and get along. And sometimes that means we have to be forgiving. And sometimes that means we just have to live with things. But it really matters to him. And, and you're going to see this a lot more when we get to John 17. But for now, just hear his heart. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Awesome. For this reason, the Father loves me because I laid down my life that I may take it up again. Now, this is very important to Jesus, and he wants you to get this. No one takes it from me. Do you get it? I mean, you think about it for a second. He doesn't want you to be like, wow, wow, got really crazy there, you know? I guess they, I guess they lost control. What's he doing on that cross? Ah! Every, uh, incorrect. He's not just the shepherd. The Bible says he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before there was Adam and Eve, before there was apple, before there was fall. There was cross. This was always in God's plan. And Jesus Christ, God himself, wants us to know, hey, this wasn't something that went south, okay? No milk got spilt. This wasn't plan B. I don't do plan B. I'm the God of the universe. This was plan A always. I created you with choice. You chose wrong. I stepped in to save you from yourself. I'm the door. I'm the shepherd. And this wasn't some kind of disaster. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I, of course you do, of course you do. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Awesome. Jesus, the life giver. Now, I imitate his sacrifice for my freedom. Freedom is found. Jesus said, he who loses his life for my sake will, tell me, will find it, will find it. And joy and peace and fulfillment and abundance that Jesus describes, I have come that they might have life abundantly. Abundance is not found, loved ones, in hanging on to your life. Oh, my life, my life, this is my life. It's, it's, it's. Abundance is found in laying your life down. You give your life up. Give your life up for Jesus. Give your life up for your family. Give your life up for the church. You give your life up for the kingdom. And in laying it down, See, he said, no one took this from me. I just gave it up. Just laid it down. In 1 Peter 
2 says, Christ also suffered for us, leaving an example that we should follow in his steps. So he's not, uh, he's not showing us, no miracles here. He's just flat out telling us. He's telling us this, I'm the door, follow me to salvation. I'm the good shepherd, embrace my ownership for security. I gave my life, imitate me, and you'll experience freedom. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. From our lips flow words of deep gratitude for the God of the universe who stepped into space and time and lived the life that we could not live and died the death that we could not die and paid the price that we could not pay for our forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. You are the door. You are the peace we were created to need. Thank you, Jesus. You are the good shepherd. You have led me to green pasture. Forgive my stubbornness. You have led me to abundant life. Increase my gratitude. Yes, Lord Jesus, you did give your life for my forgiveness. And as an example, help me in my home, where I work, in this church, wherever it's hardest to give my life, to give it again, to give it again, to give it again, and to believe in the giving, Lord, Help me to believe that in the giving is the finding, is the freedom, is the fulfillment, is the abundance. Forgive me for calculating how my life is going. I don't have a life. I have an owner. And he has been so good to me. Thank you for that reality, Lord. Amen. Thanks for listening to Walk in the Word. We pray that God's Spirit has ministered to you in the exact way that you needed. These messages are the fruit of James McDonald's weekly pulpit ministry, and now you can access every new sermon on our website, fresh from the weekend service. For more information on how to get James' most recent message, go to walkintheword.org. That's where you'll find the sermon videos, audio, and video podcasts, as well as devotionals and other Bible study resources. Again, go to walkintheword.org or call 888-581-WORD. All of our ministry resources are focused on helping you continue to grow in Christ as you walk in the Word.